I want to welcome everyone to this uh, very interesting and exploring topic that we are going to be approaching this evening. I thought I would just say a few words in introducing it because um, in a way, uh, as Martin has reminded me, I'm something of the father of this idea that we would bring the Abrahamic religions to CEU and begin to explore uh, what they mean historically and what they mean today. Um, I've always been fascinated. Uh, I was a young historian who decided to go in a different direction, and I went into the law and into history and into uh, international relations. But uh, before I uh, lost academic contact with history and then refound it when I came to see you, um, I was particularly interested in what I called the, the clash of uh, different civilizations. And I began to develop theories which are very superficial and have been brought forth uh, further by others in much greater depth about how uh, certain religions are the source of conflict, uh, even though they may have very uh, common roots. And particularly in the case of monotheistic religions, uh, which of course believe that they are the one true religion and that uh, have themselves proselytizing and built-in messianic qualities before you even get to issues of, of doctrine, uh, there it becomes quite easy for political leaders to manipulate the religion, the monotheistic religion and the people who are its adherents into uh, entering into conflict with others who may not be of the same monotheistic uh, background. So uh, just a couple of facts that I found fascinating. Uh, first, uh, as I understand it, 54 percent of the world's population now uh, is at least rooted in, if not directly adherent to, the three Abrahamic religions, which is quite remarkable. Um, they are, of course, all rooted themselves in one original source, to varying degrees they adhere to that, and that is Abraham, uh, the biblical Abraham in Judaism, who is in fact the father of uh, Judaism. Certainly his son Isaac is seen as the father of the Israelites. And then uh, Muhammad, uh, the prophet, who uh, traces his lineage back to the other son of Abraham, Ishmael, although in this case, uh, apparently, Islamic doctrine is not so clear on whether or not that's the origin of Muhammad. Uh, and then finally, in Christianity, I mean, the clarity of the direct relationship to Abraham is, is there simply in the fact that virtually all uh, Christians in the early days were Jews, and this was the direct relationship that were that was was developed. So obviously, despite these common roots, uh, we have seen over the years vast differences developing, uh, differences that have had enormous impact on uh, not only each other but on on basically the global situation as it has developed. But we've also seen that these three uh, great religions have been the source of much of Western civilization and even more broadly uh, elements of Eastern civilization uh, and culture. So uh, conflict and culture come obviously out of the three of them. So the fast, what, what fascinated me was how to look at their roots. Can we look at them in terms of commonality uh, or, in fact, is the conflict that I've just described inevitably built in, either doctrinally because they're monotheistic religions, or because uh, there are other elements that are uh, more aggressive, each toward the other religion. Now, that sounds like a very dark picture, and I don't think that's necessarily the case. I think, in fact, today uh, there is uh, an increasing possibility, and, and certainly I think as our distinguished lecturer will tell us, that globalization is actually producing some degrees of 
uh, cooperation among the uh, Abrahamic religions. And whether some of that can be brought out of, elicited from their common roots is the question that I put before the CEU when we developed this series of lectures that I believe this is now the third in our series. And so it's, it's, it's a great uh, privilege for me to welcome Professor uh, Kippenberg to CEU, and I'm gonna leave to my colleague, Professor Riedel, the introduction. So thank you. I thank our rector and president for his uh, introductory remarks and especially for his initiative uh, for this whole uh, lecture series. This is now the third. Um, and uh, it's my privilege to introduce our speaker today, uh, Professor Kippenberg. He's an internationally acclaimed German scholar of the history and sociology of religion who has extensively worked on all Abrahamic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Uh, he held chairs for comparative religion at the universities of Groningen and Bremen. And he was from 98 to 2009 a fellow at the Max Weber College Erfurt. And now he is a professor for comparative religious studies at private Jacobs University Bremen, which is a, a project very much and in many ways similar to the project of CEU. Um, he also held several other visiting professorships and fellowships at the University of Chicago, uh, Barilan University, Ramat Gan, uh, Wissenschaftskolleg Berlin, Institute of Advanced Studies in Princeton, just to name a few. His field of research are Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, the history of religions and socio the sociology of religion of Max Weber. And if I understand him correctly, his perennial or persistent interest is in the sociological background of religious formations, but also in Max Weber's sense in the inverse question of how religion shapes communities. And most recently, he has especially addressed the question of how and why religious communities turn violent. Um, Professor Kippenberg's publications cover a wide range from the ancient Middle East to the present day pressing social religious topics of our age of globalization. He is the editor of the Journal of Religion of Europe, and among his books, I saw that he took the books I'm most impressed by off from his CV, so I, I put it back on, which is a volume which was originally his, um, his uh, Max Weber lectures given in Heidelberg in 1988 under the title The Mid Middle Eastern Redemptive Religions in their relationship with ancient city domination, which follows up on a thesis uh, by Max Weber saying that the depolitization of urban elites led to the emergence of redemptive religiosity, um, a thesis which is not really worked out in Max Weber, but which uh, Professor Kippenberg has turned into a comprehensive research program. In 2002, he published his Discovering Religious History in the Modern Age with uh, Princeton University Press, and this is a book which makes a very interesting attempt to analyze the rise of academic um, comparative religious studies as a particular response to modernization. He also contributed to the ongoing critical edition of the works of Max Weber, by especially editing the famous section on religion in uh, Wirtschaft und Gesellschaft. And more recently, he published together with Tilman Seidensticker a book which caused a lot of, of controversy uh, the 9-11 Handbook Annotated Translation and Interpretation of the Attacker's Spiritual Manual, which is mainly um, an edition, translation, and comment on the spiritual manual that was found of several of the terrorist groups involved in the 9-11 attacks. And his recent book is uh, entitled Violence as Worship, Religious Wars in the Age of Globalization, published by Stanford University Press in 2011. Professor Kippenberg's lecture today is entitled In a World Globalizing the Communities of Abraham's Ears. Professor Kippenberg. Yeah, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, 
I'm really glad to be here when I received that invitation immediately on answer yes I would like to come. I know this institution and there's a lot of connection between the place where I'm now working or one's work and and this institution and therefore I'm really glad to be here in particular because never before I visited Budapest. Wow, therefore I'm staying long. So I am asked to address the issue of Abrahamic religions. And this is my lecture. I first will issue the spread of religious communities in today's globalizing world and the concept of secularization. That's my first part. Second part, uh, I'm addressing the construction of Abrahamic religions as a common religious legacy of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam in the Western world in particular, but not only. And then the third part will deal with the city of Hebron and the contemporary conflict between Muslims and Jews. So my first part, and I start with a uh, quotation, an idea brought forward by Jürgen Hamamas in a discussion with Josef Ratzinger. And here he is addressing the question, are there pre-political foundations of the democratic constitutional state necessary? And is it perhaps religious fellowship? And his argument is as follows. He's saying markets and bureaucracy, modern power, so to speak, are expelling solidarity from more and more spheres of life. It is in the interest of the constitutional state to deal carefully with all the cultural sources that nourish the citizen's consciousness of norms and solidarity. Something can remain intact in the communal life of the religious fellowship that has been lost. A solidarity with those who are oppressed and insulted, pressing forward in order to hasten on the coming of the messianic salvation. This is the idea he expressed in his talk with uh, Josef Ratzinger. And the point is, he is not saying there is already that solidarity that is evicted by markets and bureaucracy from our modern life world, but there's a model, there's a semantic paradigm, and we should try to preserve the, po the capabilities and potentials of that paradigm and that uh, semantic paradigm for establishing solidarity. When you now have a look at the development of the religions in the um, 20th century, the main point has been that religions are turned in private issues. Privatization, individualization was regarded as the main social form of religions in modern society. And Habermas is drawing attention to the fact that this is not the entire story. There is also an element of what he then is calling the religious solidarity. And you can observe this with regard to that fact that labor migrants coming to Western Europe are turning their associations, their commonality, into mosque communities. So the spread of Muslims in Europe is closely then connected with identifying their heritage in religious terms. And here you see the situation as it was uh, in the beginning of the 21st century. When you are, have a map from the 60s, you will discover that there's a clear division of the big religions according to territory and geography. This changed, and what is crucial, that this spread of religions is connected to the rise, the spread of religious communities. Take, for example, Great Britain, the mosques in Great Britain in 1966-18, then in 1997,000, or in West or Europe altogether, in 2007, 8,700, and then also the figures for Germany. 
So there's a clear increase in the establishing of mosques in Europe. But what is a mosque? First, it is a place where people migrating to Europe are entering our society. In the Netherlands, there is an interesting research done in the mosque congregations in that country, at all 475, and that these mosques are providing social services normally expected to be provided by the Dutch state, but they are doing it for themselves. And the Dutch people are always interested in counting and in, in clearly describing these services in guilders, yeah, in euros. Uh, they said it's about 150 million euros they save us because they are doing it on a volunteering basis. And what are these services, language courses, information meetings, assistance in finding jobs, uh, housing, also in finding housing, selling halal food, advising people in legal issues. And it's interesting to have a closer look at these mosque communities because mostly people are saying these are places where disintegration takes place in West European society. They don't want to be here, but in fact, when you have a look at these mosque communities, you are discovering a s different story. These are places of integration, where people find the possibilities to <coughs> develop those capabilities, those needs they had to answer to become part of the industrialized society. This is one, and the other element Crucial, con clearly connected to this process of establishing uh, Moscow communities is, of course, the international freedom of religion. In the, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Article 18, everyone has the right to freedom of thought, conscience, and religion. This right includes freedom to change his religion or belief, and freedom either alone or in community with others and in public or private, to manifest his religion or belief in teaching, practice, worship, and observance. It's interesting to see that in, uh, th this element in community is special. Mostly these human rights are individual rights, but in this case, the individual rights extends to the community. So you, you are entitled to practice this in community with others, and there's no word about that there is a special cons uh, approval ne necessary, either by state or by the hierarchy of your community, you can do it. If you are convinced, we should do it. And then you are allowed to teaching, practice, worship, and observance. So there is not only an allowance for this, yes, you are entitled to establish a religious community. And the Muslims, the labor migrants, deciding to establish their communities, they had this right on their side. In the European Convention of Human Rights, there's added an element that also includes some kind of protection of this right. If you are establishing such a community, you are also protected, for example, from defamation. You have a right also to be respected. This, of course, can generate clashes, disputes, for example, the one regarding Simon Rushdie's Satanic Verses. The book Satanic Verses celebrated as a kind of modern novel in the post-colonial uh, society. In fact, when, re when it addresses Muslim issues, is speaking a, a language of defamation. It's not Muhammad, but Umahund. So, a curse word. And it's happening all in the city of Jahiliya, paganism. Yeah. And the prostitutes in that city, they all wear the names of the wives of the prophet. So, it's not necessary to read the entire book to understand that here a language is used derived from the hateful language of the modern multicultural metropolis of our world. So, therefore, the book 
was not allowed in India because the government thought this would affect an element in our constitution that prevents riots between religious communities in the country. And the same, the British people in Bradford found freedom of speech, yes, but freedom to assault, no. And isn't there a blasphemy law in the law of the United Kingdom? There is. And so they brought the publisher to court in London, hearing that this is not applicable, the blasphemy law, because it is only reserved for Christians. So the next step, they went to Strasbourg. In Strasbourg, applied the European Convention on Human Rights, saying this right of uh, rigid freedom is restricted with regard to the laws of a country and to democracy. But this is in England only protecting Christianity. And what's interesting is that now in, the, in Great Britain started a debate about the blasphemy law. And very intriguing dispute and at the end there was the decision we abolish the blasphemy law and they did it and we replace it by a law prohibiting hate speech, religious hate speech. So it's, you see there is an element included in this return of religious communities in particular with Islam that of course affects our own society. And therefore the entire issue of secularization comes up in this context. And there is an author, Jose Casanova, who made a proposal for revise the entire concept by saying the concept of secularization consists of three independent propositions. And let us have a look at them independently. And first, the assumption that there is a decline of religion in modern society. And the answer is, there is no decline of religious beliefs in modern society, in modern culture. Grace Davy makes the same point. Believing without belonging. You can't count belonging to come to the conclusion in how far people are religiously convicted. The second point is, there is a differentiation of secular and religion domains. Secular sphere, spheres as education, law, economy, politics, they are becoming independent from religion. Religions, on the other side, are of course now deprived from state support and their social form are voluntary associations. So when they are continuing in their existence in a communal form, then this is the proper form in the secularized industrial Western society. And the third point is that privatization of belief, and there is that privatization, entails deprivatization. Private beliefs and values are transferred to the public sphere and public norms to the private sphere. And this is a crucial point in the argument by José Casanova, also of interest for this issue of Abrahamic communities in the modern secularized world. He is saying by bringing publicity into the private moral sphere and by bringing the into the public sphere issues of private morality, religions force modern societies to confront the task of reconstructing their own normative foundations. He's arguing this in this book, Public Religions in the Modern World. And the example, the case, Great Britain, is exactly that. Yeah. You are requiring something as a believer, as a member of a community, and your experience is this case of a protection only reserved for Christianity. And now the English society has to start a debate about what's our foundation. And the answer in this regard was we have to change the law. So this is the situation you may see say from these migrating religious communities in a world globalizing. And you can bring this into a draft, the center, the constitutional state, with these 
internal dynamics first in the direction of privatization, socialization of public tasks, and on the other side of internationalization with, that, with laws, possibilities of acting that are covered and protected by international law. And when you are introducing into this scheme religious communities today, it would look as follows, that there are these well-known local religious congregations. But there are also now these cultures we call enclave cultures, parallel societies or other notions, and the mosque community, where all those services given, provided by a state, are generated by the members, as far as is possible, of course. And then, in addition, there is the transnational religion. Also, these religions, they are not really part of the constitution national state as it is developed in its history. They are new and they are entertaining relations to groups, to authorities outside the nation state that is not really controllable by the constitutional nation state. That is the, the element of these security problem, which is connected with these transnational kinds of religion, and in particular Muslim. Muslims are belonging to that, but uh, Christianity as well, and Judaism not a different case. So this is, was my first part. The religious communities in the world globalizing. To make clear to you, there are more, much more kinds of uh, social relations based on religion than the ones we know from uh, recent times. There's a tremendous development going on. Now the second part, the category Abrahamic religions. Of course, you Judaism, Christianity, Islam, they all know Abraham or Ibrahim. But the construction that this is a common denominator of some interest is an issue of the 20th century. And this is very nicely studied in this book. Huff's Abrahamic Religions on the Use and Abuses of History appeared last year ago. And he is arguing as follows. He's saying the category, when we have a look at the category, came up in the 60s, in the 50s and in the 60s. When people, Western people in particular, people living in societies on a process of secularizing, when people looked for a common religious ground in the fight against secularism, where are the sources for a morality, for ethics, if we are living in a society in which morality and ethics is becoming part of subjective decisions? Here are the sources. Abraham is the, uh, the common origin of the three monotheisms. This is the common denominator also of, of course, mobilizing religious communities, churches, synagogues, mosques, against spreading secularism. And then the second version after 9-11. And now the category carried the expectation of a peaceful relation among the three religions. And this at a time when these relations were perceived as hostile. It's a category coming up in a situation when exactly that, what it says, doesn't is anymore evident and for everybody uh, existing. And then also in this context, academic box, conferences, <coughs> endo chairs in Oxford recently, chair for Abrahamic religions, uh, Guy Strunza is appointed on the chair. They are today devoted to the so-called Abrahamic religions. And this lecture series as well belongs to this phenomenon. Yeah? And touted as a symbol of a religious commonality, Abraham can just as easily function as one of division and exclusivity. Exactly what you s said. Yeah? That's, that's part of this, his argument. So therefore, it's necessary to have a closer look at the entire category and the way what is it is covering. When you are addressing Abrahamic religions, the first book trying to do this was by Francis Peters, 
The Children of Abraham, already published in the 80s, in 1989, and then rewritten, not a updated version, rewritten in 2004. Very interesting. And because 9-11 was in between, a completely different relation between these religions with such a clear common denominator, and then with a preface, a well-known scholar, John Esposito, saying, and despite close family resemblances, and you see them, monotheism, promise of land, chosen people, community, ethics and law, sacred scriptures, world religion, theology, it's a tremendous amount of similarities between these different religions, but then Esposito, despite close family resemblances, relations between Judaism, Christianity and Islam have been characterized by tension, conflicts and persecution. Exactly that point. Yeah. We are experiencing both at the very same time. We are discovering the similarities and we are discovering the div divisions and the conflict. And when you are now going back to the crucial elements of this Abrahamic religion, it starts with a migrant. Yeah. Religion, all three religions, they are not confined to a certain territory. Heinrich Heine is speaking about Judaism as portable homeland because it has a Torah, the scroll. The scroll makes it a, is a portable homeland where there is a scroll, the Bible, there you can have Judaism. And the same holds true for cr Christianity and for Islam. So at the very beginning, the divine promise to Abraham, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. In receiving these words, he lived in Mesopotamia, not in Palestine. So, and you all, he heard this word, there you will get the land, there you will have a great, a huge progeny. And he trusted the word of God. He went there, giving up all he had in Mesopotamia. So Abraham went, as the Lord has told him, and got land at a huge progeny. But the history didn't end in Palestine. In between these words of the promise, there is one element that deserves special attention. It is said, after go from your country, your people, and when you are doing this, I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. And I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. So now others are introduced into the plot. Not only Abraham with the promise, also others, those blessing him, they are participating in that blessing. And those cursing him, they also are getting part, are uh, subject of that curse. So, and this now is, makes the crucial elements of the history of the chosen people. You may say the plot. There is God's covenant with Abraham, Ibrahim, and his heirs. Then there is Abraham's exemplary obedience, not only when accepting that promise, promise, believing that promise, but also when God asked him to offer his son Isaac and Ishmael. Then the next, rejecting idolatry and intermarriage with non-believers. Redemption of the blessed people from evil. And final, prophets announcing doom when believers are defecting from the covenant. These all are elements of that plot connected with Abraham and the promise to Abraham. And the trust he said he gave to this promise. And with regard to what is called the legacy of monotheism, it is of course a crucial element in that story that the Israelites lay claim to the land not because they were born in it, entitled to it, but because God has promised it to them. 
when the Lord is said in the fifth book of Moses, before they are seeing already the promised land and now they are ready to invade and then they are hearing when the Lord your God brings you into the land which you are entering to take possession of and clears away many nations before you, then you must utterly destroy them. You shall make no covenant with them and show no mercy with them. So what's special here is that not everyone has a share in the blessing. Those living in the country don't have a share in it. As if there were a shortage of blessing, a shortage of salvation. Shortage, one land, one people, one nation, is inscribed, you may say, in the Bible as a principle of unity. There is a great book by this author, Regina Schwarz, The Curse of Kind, The Violent Legacy of Monotheism, and bringing a lot of other stories with exactly that same point of scarcity of blessing. Yeah. No plethora, no scarcity. The farmer kind offered to the Lord a sacrifice of the fruits of the field while his brother Abel, a shepherd, offered some of the firstborn of his sheep. And then the Lord looked with pleasure on Abel and his animal sacrifice, but rejected kind and his plant sacrifice. And this, as you all know, enraged kind and he murdered Abel. Yeah. Or a second story, Jacob obtained by trickery the blessing of his blind father Isaac by pretending to be Esau. And when now Esau asked his father Jacob, bless me also, my, oh my father, the answer was, your brother has taken away your blessing. <coughs> Behold, I have made him your Lord. What then can I do for you, my son? Scarcity of blessing, only one, and certainly not those in the country living as the Palestinians. Yeah. So, conclusion, when we are speaking about religious communities, we are speaking about history. We are speaking about certain phenomena used to understand the place of that blessed community in the history. And it all starts with that Jews, Christians and Muslims see themselves as addressees of the divine promise to Abraham. And then the history of salvation of the community from evil uh, is distinct from their secular history and revealed by prophets and apocalyptic writings. You always have to understand where you are, where is your place in that history of salvation, in particular if you are living under completely different circumstances. And then second, the community requests from its members to practice solidarity. Huh? The mosque communities helping each other to become integrated in the modern Western society. Third, when the existence of the community is threatened, the members are expected to fight against internal defectors and external enemies, even including the idea, the ideal of martyrdom. And fourth, the community claims legitimacy, legality by the social orders of its society and support in the fight against blasphemy. Think of the Muslims in Great Britain. So there are elements structuring these communities. You can clearly see when you are departing from this promise to Abraham and all that what is included when you are believing that you are the community that is entitled to get the salvation. So this is, that was the second part of my talk. And now the last one, it's about Hebron. Uh, the cave of the patriarchs or the Ibrahimi mosque. It is an Arabic al-Khalil that derives from the Quranic epithet of Abraham, Khalil al-Rahman, the beloved of the merciful or friend of God. And it translates, translates these friends of God 
exactly the ancient Hebrew toponym Hebron understood as Haber, friend of God. This is the city of the friend of God. And here is the tomb of Abraham and his wives and a couple of his families. And when you now <coughs> are looking at the history, at the recent history of uh, that city, you will encounter somebody who may be called correctly as a contemporary prophet. We all believe that we are not living in times of prophecy anymore, but it's wrong. Here is one. And with the impact on modern history, you will realize in a moment. We are seeing here Tzvi Yehuda Kok. And three weeks before the Six-Day War, in 1967, in his yeshiva, gave the same sermon. And suddenly in that sermon, he switched into a lamentation. They divided my land, he shouted. The United Nations in 1947-48. It's in the background. <coughs> Day of independence yeah? in my ni 1967. They divided my land, he shouted. While all others were celebrating the existence of Israel, he started this kind of lamentation. Then, forcefully, with a fierce love for the Torah and the honor of God, he cried, And where is our Hebron? Do we forget this? And where is our Shechem? Do we forget about this? And where is our Jericho? Do we forget this too? And the ensuing Six-Day War, three weeks later, was of course already titled as a war of redemption. A redemption that ransomed the biblical land of Israel from the unbelievers. And he was a head of a yeshiva, and that yeshiva taught the students even when the settlements in Israel is done by secular settlers, in fact, they are doing something that is not secular, that is part of a divine plan. We are in a stage of a restitution of Israel in the Promised Land. This was a way to integrate secular understanding of what was going on in Israel into a religious framework or interpretation. And the next step, of course, was that followers in his school and followers from himself formed Gush Emunim, the block of the faithful, and they spoke a language that legitimized settlements in the occupied territories. Occupied territories, that's in, uh, I should write them in uh, uh, quotation marks, it's a legal term. It has to do with the uh, international right regarding territories conquered by states and uh, administered under martial law. Ter occupied territories are territories not belonging to Israel, but administered by the Israeli army under martial law. And now they were convinced, oh, something quite different is at hand. Redemption is underway. Eretz Yisrael is holy and cannot be shared with the Gentiles. And there is an inherent link between settlement of the Holy Land and hastening the coming of the Messiah. And finally, of course, international law doesn't apply. So this is Gush Emonim. And then this was the situation in 1967. You see uh, the uh, Green Line, uh, the Armistice Line from 1949. And now what happened in, in this region it is the target of settlement in a relative sense. We are restituting Israel in its entirety. And when you are going years later, you are discovering that the entire territory now dedicated to a Palestinian state is full of Jewish settlements. It's a little bit the Balkan, so to speak, intentionally produced after the Likud government came to power in Israel after 1978. So these black points are all these, oh sorry, these Jewish settlements 
and they are today 250 with half a million Israeli citizens living there and with all these settlements they are not Palestinian territory they are belonging legally to Israel yeah. and they are connected with Israel by roads reserved for the Israelis. So there are a lot to say about this, but one word I would like to add. You also can say this creates a problem for Israel. And the problem is when you are saying this is biblical land and we want a, a Jewish state in the biblical land, then you can't be any more a democracy. Because there are millions of Arabs living there, more than Israeli citizens in Israel then. Or you want to be a Jewish state, then you are not a democracy. That's a crucial problem for Israel. It's not only a problem for the international community, there's an internal problem rising in Israel. Yeah. So this is, this is a situation uh, on the ground. Abrahamic religion, you can't share the blessing. That's, that's a crucial background. And then the figures regarding the settlement, I leave this out. And now let's have a look from the other side. You can have also a chart, a map, from the side of the Palestinians. And y then you see all these green territories are Palest Palestinian ones in 1946. And when you are going, the years, 1947, after the first war between uh, Palestinians or uh, Arabs and Israel and then to 1967 you see it becomes sm smaller and smaller parts and this is a situation principle of today and that's a background that there's a very interesting discussion among Palestinians about a two-state solution and the discussion among Palestinians is there will never be a state which can answer the elementary requirement for, for living in it. So what we want is one state with a constitution giving all people and all communities in that state equal rights. It's very, it's very interesting to see this upcoming director of the Arab University in East Jerusalem, Musairi, wrote a book about this with arguments. So there will also be, it's not only an issue of the side of the, those responsible for occupation, it's also an issue on the other side that the situation are changing. And you can't, you can't control the change of the situation. You may be perhaps try to uphold a certain s situation with all the military means you have, but the development that falls ensues is not controllable anymore. So this is the Palestinian side, and now also what, what happened now with regard to Hepan. It's so interesting to have a closer look at Hepan. This is Hepan, the battle for the blessed land, the promised land. Huh? The Oslo Accords allocate, allocated to the Palestinian Authority, established in Ramallah, dozens of semi-autonomous enclaves called Area B, civil Palestinian control, Israeli security control, both. No? And Hebron City, with 130,000 Palestinian inhabitants, surrounded by Area C, and this is full Israeli control with settlements, bypass roads, and checkpoints. And in 1997, Israel divided the city itself in two zones. 90,000 of the city's inhabitants came under Palestinian jurisdiction, whereas 40,000 Palestinians remained under direct Israeli occupation for the sake of about 450 Israeli settlers living in the center of Hebron. You see, ongoing history. Yeah. And what you are still seeing, there are crucial elements in the ideas, in the understanding, in the definition of the situation derived from religious history and certainly <laughs> not from modern <laughs> legal thinking. Yeah. Uh, and now two conflicts clear. One is happened uh, 
in Purim, at Purim, Jewish festival, celebrating that they were preserved from a massacre long ago in the Babylonian Empire. Uh, in 1994, an American uh, doctor, Dr. Baruch Goldstein, approached uh, the building. You remember, it's now part of two places of veneration in it for the Muslims and for the Jews. And when ent approaching the building, he was insulted by uh, teenagers, Arab teenagers, with words, slaughter the Jews. Yeah. Enraged, went he back to Kiryat Abba, that's a settlement, a Jewish settlement near Hebron, took his machine gun, returned, and killed all those Muslim prayers until the machine gun was, was empty. And then he was trampled death by the surviving, surviving uh, people in that place. So that's a story. And then there's a tombstone for the martyr. Here lies the saint, Dr. Baruch Goldstein. Blessed be the memory of the righteous and holy man. May the Lord avenge his blood, who devoted his soul to the Jews. Jewish religion and Jewish land. His hands are innocent and his heart is pure. He was killed as a martyr of God on the 14th of Adar Purim in the year 5054. So, wh what you see is there is in that entire situation a tremendous source of violence present. It's only one case, but this is the most famous one in particular because it has repercussions in another field. Now, the Muslim brothers organizing the resistance in the Intifada decided to establish a military wing. Yeah. The se self-killing brigades, yeah. self-martyrdom operation, brigades, the reaction to that. And then the other one is the assassination of the Prime Minister Rabin, one year later, Oslo process. For religious settlers, exchanging land for peace in the Oslo Accords is tantamount to apostasy. To vote to return the land is equivalent to declaring your brother to be a thief. It's not your land. You do not believe anymore in the promise. And in rabbinical tradition was circulated, anyone who delivered Jews to this, to this fate or persecuted them must be killed if necessary. And a Talmudic student at Bar Ilan University, Yigal Amir, considered himself authorized to take action by, rabbinical, by the rabbinical statement and murdered the prime minister in 1995 during a peace rally in Tel Aviv. So this is on the side of the Jewish side. And now let's very briefly also sh look at the other side. There's the same idea coming up of the promise, the promised land. We can't share with others. The Islamic resistance movement, Harakata al Mukawama al Islamiyya, it's from the Muslim Brothers, an organization established to coordinate the Intifada. In its first communique in December 1987, speaks about border fighters defending Islamic territory against external foes. What, what we see is civil obedience as we know it from the United States. Young teenagers throwing stones against an occupation army. And now this is interpreted also in religious terms. And because there were people killed, these are, of course, martyrs. And then in that leaflet, that very first leaflet, that settlers must be made to realize that the Palestinian people knows the path of paradise, paradi the path of sacrifice and martyrdom and that it is generous in this regard. Threat, yeah, clear threat to Israeli settlers. And then the Islamic resistance movement, established a year later, believes that the land of Palestine is an Islamic waqf, consecrated for future Muslim generations until judgment date. It or any part of it should not be squandered. It or any part of it should not be given up. So it's exactly the same. You can't share it with others. So are there other voices? I wouldn't like to close without two additional remarks, Mayor. Yeah, it's time is gone. Only 
two slides, Martin Buber realizing living in a country with opposing, with, in a land with opposing claims, claims, we consider it a fundamental point that in the case of Jews and Palestinians, he wrote, two vital claims are opposed to each other. We are convinced that it must be possible to find some form of agreement between this claim and the other, for we love this land. We are seeing that such love are present on the other side as well. Where there is faith and love, a solution may be found even to what appears to be a tragic contradiction. So, Buber, one land, two nations, a Jewish interpretation of the situation of Jewish settlements and pa Palestinian villages in the same country. And then, most recently, today, Ta'ayush, a grassroots nonviolent organization established in 2000 by a group of Palestinians and Jewish citizens of Israel. A grassroots movement of Arabs and Jews working to break down the walls of racism and segregation by constructing a true Jewish partnership, Arab-Jewish partnership. Together, we strive for a future of equality, justice and peace through concrete, daily, nonviolent actions of solidarity to end the Israeli occupation of the Palestinian territories and to achieve full civil equality for all. That's not showing up in our newspaper reports, that there are these grassroots movements consisting of citizens of Israel and Palestinians and trying to prevent settlers to demolish the meadows of Bedouins, Arab Bedouins, to destroy the caves they are living in. And these people, there's a colleague of mine from Hebrew University, David Schulman, and again and again, after Shabbat writes a new report about a common attempt with others to prevent these deeds of evil. So, there is something going on. And perhaps there are people saying, oh, we don't believe that the life, our own life should be dedicated to such a conflict. And then there's also, in the Abrahamic tradition, there's a right nice story, and it goes as follows. Abraham, on the way, on migration, is approaching Sodom, and realizing what's going on with regard to Sodom, that God's anger is growing and growing, and he wants to destroy it. And now Abraham started arguing with God, and saying, you can't do that if there are still people that are right and just in the city. And now the command of God regarding this intervention of Abraham for other people, not Jewish people, but righteous people that do not deserve destruction. I have chosen Abraham so that he will direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just so that the Lord will bring about for Abraham what he has promised him. So Abraham is the one who is fighting for justice and not in terms of a scarcity of blessing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Kistenberg. Uh, very happy that you ended with such a somewhat uh, reassuring note, but uh, thank you also for uh, reminding us that the symbol of Abraham, of course, can also be one of, of difference and, uh, and of conflict and mutual exclusion. Um,
The, the, the issue of religions, traditions today in this secularized world is there is no accepted authority in the past that is informing belief today. We are those who are validating, subscribing to certain traditions in the past. It's this, in this regard, the authority is not with the tradition, the authority is with us. And the point is, are there in the traditions elements that are different than those which are inspiring this fight for the blessing? And there are. The entire Abraham tradition shows this. This construction of violent traditions is a construction. As the construction of peaceful traditions is a construction, and the answer is very simple, we are always responsible for the tra traditions we are declaring as valid for us. It's, it's, our, it's our responsibility. There's no, no way to avoid that responsibility we take. But it's crucial to understand that there are in the Bible with regard to this Abrahamic tradition also those who are allowing for a vision like Buba or the grassroots movements. It's the justice and not only the blessing which is reserved for us and our progeny. So that's my answer. It's a new kind of arguing with rich necessary. But then the issue of responsibility comes back in a different manner. Poli politicians are responsible for the selection they make regarding their political support for religious visions or interpretations of a situation. When Sharon decided in 1978, oh, the settlement movement, Gush Imunim, oh, this wonderful, we support it to prevent any future division of Palestine in two different states that were the background, then he is responsible for that. But it's indeed something that is the, the issue of responsibility of politicians is coming back. Therefore, it's necessary that in the religious field there is more awareness for these different options. That it's not evident that it's the Bible is in favor only of this understanding of blessing and justice. There are other under possible understandings available <coughs> in the tradition. In the gra grassroots movements, Tayush, for example, with this idea of coexistence of Jews and non-Jews, they are also tapping on that source, religious source, on that religious fellowship, as, as Sabamas is saying. Like in? An essence, like one message. Is there an inclination towards one side of the interpretation, or is are the two parts completely equal? No, they are not completely equal. Uh, take, for example, these 
um, citation from the fifth book of Moses. You are not allowed to make a covenant with the Goyim, with the non-Jews. Yeah? It's clear uh, as what. Well. But when you have a look at the Jewish history, there are again and again cases where Jews make contracts with pagans. F most famous one, the Maccabean War. The Maccabean War against Seleucid rulers who turned Jerusalem into a pagan uh, temple. So is Olympus. Unbelievable for Jews. Yeah. Then, of course, insurgents, resistance. And the Maccabees were looking who is the enemy of my enemy. And the enemy of his enemy, the Romans, going to Rome, making a contract with him. So the point is the existence and the well being of the religious community is more crucial than only to put verses said in the past into a present reality. In most it's written, you should make a contract with them, but they are doing it. So the point is not that it is completely uh, independent of the tradition. No, it's related to a community, the communal reflection, what's necessary for, what the well-being of the community. That is a good, a prior good regarding the interpretation of, of the scripture. So, and this is, holds true for Islam as well. Very interesting. The new interpretations of Islam by Tariq Ramadan in, in Europe. It's a clear case. They are reformulating their traditions in terms of the well-being of the Muslim citizens in Europe. So I would answer that way. There are these differences, these contradictions in, in the scriptures, and there are much more but the validity is given in terms of a situation of the community of the believers, ten minutes, at least in this field. Yeah. Uh, I see so many <laughs> questions, but I, I really doubt it's possible to, uh, to, to ask short questions. It's possible to give it to short questions. Uh, thank you for this wonderful presentation, Professor. Uh, just one question. Uh, from the onset, from the very onset of the Zionist, movement. There were several conflicting views of Palestine and, and the Holy Land and how to occupy it and what, what is our part. Uh, my question is, is there any reason for you to choose the most far-right uh, view of, uh, within the Zionist movement, that is the Bush and Moin? Because the Israelis are many, 80% are against this Zionist approach. Uh, I wonder if it's, if you had any uh, special approach to the question in order to present the Israeli view to the Bush and Moon, if that was not sure. Yeah, it is difficult to answer for me, to be honest. Yeah, I choose this because I'm interested in in a conflict that was in the beginning a conflict between a state, state of Israel, and its Arab neighbors and it turned into a religious conflict, into a conflict between religious communities. And this turn implied also that in Israel itself there are new kinds of conflicts. Take these assassination of Rabin, but there are much more. So this kind of turning a tradition into a violent one, one it creates new conflicts in turn in these communities. This is one element why I was interested in it. And the other one I was interested in, are interested in it, because the idea of those who are blessing, those with a promise, with a promise, and those who are cursing are cursed. This is the background of the American policy of Bu in the Bush government against Israel. So they want to be blessed because they support the restitution of Israel in its territory, in its biblical territory. So there are elements of foreign policy connected to that. I didn't go into this, but I didn't went into this, but it's a crucial element to understand the conflict. Otherwise, inimaginable, such a small entity like Israel, and in this Arab Islam-dominated region, who could they, 
are they able to preserve these claims? Yeah? And then also not to return occupied territory, say, no, this is a process of restitution of this. In these processes I'm interested in, in particular then also because American fundamentalists are sharing this vision of history. First Israel must be restituted and then they will follow the, f the end of the world. Yeah. The plot, the m present history as a, a religious plot and not without repercussions on politics and law as well. Yeah. That's what I regard as interesting. Yeah. The secularization with regard to that differentiation of spheres that religion is not anymore protected by the state, but that the spheres of the social sphere, the legal sphere, the political sphere have a dynamic of their own. This is the background also of my story. Beca because there is no really control by these, uh, by political powers or ju judicial authorities regarding these processes, we are living in a secularized world. That's Casanova. Secularized world doesn't mean marginalization of religion. It means religions in form of private associations in the public sphere, coming with their claims, and then looking for those who are supporting them. And then, indeed, politicians are crucial in that process, but they are constituting a kind of social power. That's, that's crucial. And this is not the idea of the secularized society. That's exactly this. That's uh, right. Because this language is, is uh, it, it makes references to a religious tradition, but it's not explicitly about Abrahamic faiths or Abrahamic traditions, which is more explicitly biblical. So I wonder uh, if they use yeah. that language. But it's also not the, the Bible of the fifth book of Moses, of uh, conquering Canaan. They are going back to the times of before, yeah, before uh, the slavery, the bondage in, Israel, in Egypt started. And there are models, biblical models, they are using. Yeah. But how explicit this is, I can't answer, but it's not that they are not convinced we are acting as believing Jews. And in particular, this uh, uh, Schulman is convinced that what he is doing is the justice as it is taught in the in the Bible, and the justice, the con concept of justice in the Bible includes so social elements with regards to others. And that's therefore this wonderful story with Sodom. Eh? Don't do that, Lord. Yeah, there are living righteous people, and though they are not believing, they are people s venerating other gods. Nevertheless, there is the idea of a justice. Because there you can add to that also the idea that there are formal covenants of God with Noah, for example. Yeah? Also, with the, the content of, of justice. Yeah? Uh, yeah.
what ag exact is, is the, the question? What, what I, I would say, look, when I am starting emphasizing that conflict in the Abrahamic construct or the construct, I mean, traditions, it's, you also could start a story with Abrahamic communities establishing peace. Yeah, that's very interesting. That there are, wh when I wrote a book about violence as worship, religious communities in the globalizing world, you can also have a book on religious communities establishing peace relations in certain parts. So there are both capabilities. It's crucial to understand this, but it's also crucial to see that in certain regards, these other capabilities are very marginalized. There are cases where this happened. But until now, in particular, and that's a background to the choice of the Near East conflict, you see that these religious traditions indeed are, uh, are nourishing fires of hatred. I'm not quite sure that this... I would say, with a frank answer, I guess with regard to the solution, blasphemy issue in Great Britain, I see that most states, nation states, are obliged to reflect on the foundations of these states, also in terms of religious communities, equality of religions in these states. And with regard to the Near East conflict, I'm convinced one day there will be people in Palestine and in Israel saying, stop with this crazy conflict. I don't like to invest more my own life in this future. And then perhaps thinking of South Africa, the apartheid in the 80s. All people were convinced this is the belief, this they will defend and there will be these Bantu stands for the black people and suddenly it was gone, yeah? And perhaps also in Eastern Europe, so many years people were believing in this ideology and suddenly there's a generation saying, I don't believe it anymore. And I can't imagine this kind of secularization. I indeed can imagine, imagine as a possibility. <laughs> Yeah. Because uh, if, I, if I get it right, you're, uh, you're saying that uh, the solution to religious conflict is uh, that, we, that the people have to understand that religion is a construction, a religious belief is a construction. Mm -hmm. But now for, for people, not just fundamentalists, but for, for no, normal people, uh, believing in a religion, uh, there's, a, uh, uh, there's a threat in this kind of thinking, which is that they are losing uh, the, uh, the essence of, of the religion, they are losing what, what makes uh, the, the substance of uh, the religion. So they are feeling the skepticism. And I, I'm wondering if uh, one doesn't need, uh, if one needs something which is between dogmatism on the one side, because dogmatism indeed will lead to the struggle, and on the other side, skepticism, which would just destroy uh, religion, between, because for example, for a, for a Christian, if you're, uh, if you're going too far with a context 
colonization, etc. You can see this in some theologies. You, you don't have even any more Jesus or uh, even any more something substantial which he ever has said. You're, you're just uh, losing the substance of your religion. So is, what, what would be a middle road? Or, or do you think there's no middle road? We just need... Um, no, just it's, like it's not my problem. I guess always are people believing in traditions and others are rejecting, refuting these traditions. My point is, when you are starting defining a secular conflict, as in the case of Near East, in religious terms, and you are adducing models to justify violence, then indeed there's a situation where also inside that community, people should raise their voice and saying, listen, the sword verse in Surah 9, is in a situation that is not our situation against the jihadists. Or in other case, you can use other cases. I, this application, this, the definition of crisis situation, political situation of conflict in terms of religion, that deserve more attention. And I guess neither theology, Christian theology, nor Jewish yeshivas, nor Islamic madrasas are able to address this issue in a, in a proper manner. So you're talking about this, a specific situation yeah. of applying yeah. religion to the, po the, po the, polit uh, the politicization, of, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, the politicization of, of these kinds uh, of conflict. So that politics are con transmitting to their own language, this religious language, then religious communities should immediately start examining their own traditions. Yeah, that's, that's my point. No, I don't believe that. But that's, you are opening a new chapter, I know. my dear. <laughs> I guess the time, is, the time is gone. I enjoyed it very much staying with you. Let me show you my last slide saying thanks to you. <laughs> thanks for your attention. Very stimulating. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. Hadn't, I hadn't realized yeah. when I introduced <laughs> the topic of, of politics and yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. conflict no, well, that that's